During a recent visit to the UK, I was able to check something off my shooting list that I thought might never happen. Thanks in whole to the Vickers Machine Gun Collection and Research Association and its chief benefactor, Rich Fisher, combined with a little luck in scheduling, I was able to be present at a shoot put on by the association, which itself was in support of an MOD research project. Fresh from the success of the association's commemorative shoot, marking the 100th anniversary of the disbandment of Machine Gun Corps in 1922, held at NRA Bisley about a month previous, this shoot, while not to the same scale as the massive 16-gun tribute to all things Vickers, was perhaps more indicative of the association's ongoing and periodic range work. The Vickers Machine Gun Collection and Research Association is a bona fide entity dedicated to the exhaustive and multifaceted study of the guns, equipment, organization, drills and tactics used by troops armed with the Vickers over its 50-odd years of service. Bleeding into this is a healthy inclusion of other, shall we say, associated arms, such as the Lewis and the Bren. The association conducts regular research, holds events and contributes to the greater academic understanding of these specific military arms through presentations to both the military and interested civilian groups and individuals. The association recently featured at the UK's National Army Museum, where a day-long exposition was held focused on the history and use of the Vickers, the Machine Gun Corps, and the greater employment of the weapons through their service around the globe. Apart from holding a most significant collection of both Vickers and other period arms, the association can boast a rather unique large collection of the associated ancillary kit and equipment, as would have been used by Vickers armed troops. They are also the holders of a significant, if not the best, online collection of documentation regarding British and Empire military training of the 20th century. Manuals, PAMs and other references are found in ever-increasing numbers on the association's website. Truly an incredible resource, and in fact, it was through my looking for these references and my discovery of Rich's online publishing that I first found out about the association and Rich's incredible work. It is due in large part to him that many British muzzleloaders projects were even possible, and for that I am quite grateful. Rich is supported by a dedicated group of enthusiasts who, with varying levels of involvement, assist him running, staffing and facilitating many of the association's practical historical activities. The Vickers Machine Gun Collection and Research Association is unique in its depth of research, significance of its collection of arms and equipment, and perhaps most importantly, its willingness to bring the study of British and Empire machine gunnery to the greater historical community with such detail and expertise. The visit began with a range day. True to the professional nature, typical of the association's shooting activities, there were a number of preliminaries that were attended to. We would be shooting the Vickers and the Bren, so mag and belt filling were of the utmost importance. We loaded the mags with 25 rounds and the belts were filled using the historical belt filling machine. The association members set about bringing the guns into action. Barrels and internal parts were checked and the mechanics of the guns were verified and prepped for firing. Here we can see the removal of the feed block and the removal of the lock, the securing of the muzzle cup and the removal of the barrel. Part of the scope of the shoot, which we'll discuss in a moment, was the shooting of the Bren from its fixed line tripod. You'll see, like, you can't, you can't get a, you can't get a good cheek weld and a good sight picture on it. The belt filling machine was put to good use. Oh yeah, do you want to? Yeah, yeah, Oh, okay. Everyone was run through a familiarization with TOETs or tests on elementary training following. A drill purpose Bren did duty for this purpose. Rich got about explaining the considerably more complicated Vickers 
he gave detailed explanations of the parts and the mechanism of this recoil operated weapon. Barrel casing is full of water, about seven and a half pints, and should boil up after about 600 rounds. Unlikely given what we're doing today. Main elements of the breech casing are the feed block, uh, which the number two will certainly become familiar with, the crank handle, which the number one will become familiar with. It's a crank handle, not a cocking handle, pedantry matters, um, and then the fusy spring on the left hand side here. Have you weighed them up as well? Seven. Okay, yeah. Rich is referring here to a check done as part of the pre firing procedures. This is measuring the resistance of the fusy spring to ensure that the gun functions correctly. Later on in the day, this was demonstrated for me. Until it breaks, and then you can read it off from that. This is seven to nine, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. And then we've got the cross piece, and on the cross piece, the key elements are the safety catch here. So this thumb piece that's actually seconded, and then the thumb piece. It's not a trigger, but it does the same function because it operates the trigger through a trigger bar to it. And then, so the way it works is that we have the feed block above the barrel. So we have to crank it twice as part of the load. That's why we do that. And we have to crank it twice as part of the unload. So that's why we do it like that. Um, this hose here is taking out the steam into the can. So there's a tube sits in the bottom, <coughs> the top of the barrel casing and the barrel fits in the, in the bottom. The muzzle attachment at the front end here contains the muzzle cone, uh, a muzzle cup, and a muzzle gland. As Tom this was followed by demonstrations yeah, and walkthroughs of now, the pertinent the handling drills. On a Vickers are to ensure the weapon is pointed in the safe direction. Then crank it twice. So one, release, two, release. You have to do that before you can take the ammunition out. And then you're going to check inside. So you're going to crank back and hold. Lift the top cover using that catch at the back. going to do that for you largely. The number one's going to take it to the left and just hear that one click. It just goes click and that's the pulls engaging. And By the end, all were suitably conversant with what would be required of them in the operation of the various arms. A detailed explanation of the day's shooting was also conducted and when it was all said and done, we were ready to go. The guns brought out for this day were two Vickers dating from 1940 and 1945, both of which were Australian. These were mounted on a pair of Mark IV tripods. Each was complete with a condenser can, hose, and ammunition box. Though we wouldn't be putting the guns through any kind of evolutions that would probably see the water boiled off, having the complete kit for each gun was definitely something that was well in order. For me, though I generally understood the operation of the gun, having them up close and able to get my hands on them gave me a much better appreciation for exactly how the gun worked. Upon closer inspection, I became increasingly impressed with the condition in which the guns were maintained. A testimony to the association's attention to detail. Supplementing the brace of Vickers, were two Bren guns, one a Mark II and the other the earlier Mark I. The latter was mounted on the fixed-line tripod, a piece of kit that was rarely seen past the early stages of World War II. This exercise was not an indiscriminate expenditure of ammunition, and there were specific goals laid down that the association wanted to achieve. First was a comparison of the figures of merit of 25-round bursts fired by all guns present. Second was to measure the temperatures, specifically after rapid fire. And third, to compare the results gained with modern ammunition and historical service ammunition, most of which dated from the early 1950s. Each gun would be fired a minimum of eight times, 25 rounds for each practice, and a final 125-round practice at the rapid rate, for temperature measurement. There were eventually some extra practices added, including ammunition testing, as well as with the Vickers to test other mounting systems, namely the Sangster. So we were briefed up, bombed up, the barrel casings were full of seven and a half pints of water, and those thumb pieces were just itching to be pushed. Now, admittedly, the next couple of minutes are going to be rather gratuitous. This in no way diminishes others' participation, of course. The day, led by Rich, was certainly a sum of its parts. The experience of finally sitting behind this iconic machine gun was one of those moments. 
to think of the countless men who sat behind their guns, just like I was, pulling the belt through the feed block, operating the crank handle, peering through the sights and laying the gun through the tripod's mechanism and reporting on. And so it was, I fired my first practice with the Vickers gun. We rotated positions, and next up was the Mark II Bren in the light roll. I need a mag! After a quick visit to the ammo chest for a mag, I settled in. We have a belt or magazine of 25 rounds. Load! It was not lost on me, as I took control of the gun, that a little voice in the distant past had once lectured about the approved Bren position, which featured the body positioned straight behind the gun to squarely absorb recoil and the feet held heels together with the toes dug in. It was friend of the channel Mark, whose witty delivery of these arcane details all those years ago now echoed in my head. 100 meters. Ready? A Vickers, you will fire at one 25-round burst. A Bren, you will fire at five five-round bursts. Any road time? Go on! There evidently was wisdom in those words. Imagine my surprise when the scores were read out. A two-inch group with the Bren. Uh, I'll happily send you a picture of it if you like. Rob's score was 25 shots on, and the group is at plus two inches, plus two inches. The next practice was to be with the Mark I Bren on the tripod. This device, ingenious in design, but somewhat flawed in concept, was widely issued in the early part of the war for use in defensive positions where the gun needed to be fired on a fixed line, down a road or along an obstacle or some such. It had the additional capacity of converting into an anti-aircraft mount for defense against low-flying aircraft. We laid the gun and then listened in for the command to load. Perhaps one of the more interesting characteristics of the Bren is its tendency to eject spent casings with a somewhat high degree of prejudice. This is due to the mechanics of extraction and ejection, which rely on a fixed post-type ejector. As can be seen in the clips representing each of the bursts fired, the casings bounce considerably upon hitting the ground. For the most part, the tripod seemed to provide a reasonably stable platform to fire from. One could use sandbags to further steady the device, and also changing the angle of the three legs as they are deployed would also further reduce the noticeable bounce when firing. Then it was on to the second Vickers practice. Becoming more comfortable with the drills associated with the gun, I was nevertheless quite wary of the fact that countless more hours would have been required to make these drills truly instinctive. Ready? So, let's pull it once. Right. 
The service burst for the Vickers was 25 rounds, and this can be measured as an expedient by the number two holding the belt at a point which corresponds to the bottom of the tripod socket. Okay, listen into the details of the practice. Vickers, you will fire one 25 round burst. Wrens, you will fire five five round bursts. 25 rounds doesn't last long at 550 no RPM. As mentioned, this wasn't just about me in the channel and shooting machine guns. Most of the group were to fire that day. The old time, go up. Here, a practice was shot with the Bren in the light roll with historical surplus ammunition, Mark 7 from the 1950s. In some cases, this old ammunition wasn't quite so reliable. We did have some military members attending, and this was in support of an MOD study. Modern British MTP combats were certainly complemented by the venerable Bren. Some Mark 7 ammunition was also fed through the Vickers Time. With Go noticeably off. more smoke. Everyone had such a great time getting their hands on these historic pieces. Yeah, we're just coming. The weather was hot, but set the day off nicely. I think it's safe to say that everybody out that day saw these arms as a touchstone with history. Distant relatives who may have used them in military service, or simply the ability to put into context the historical accounts of their use, were never far from anyone's mind. It wasn't all serious, though. There were others, like me, who had never fired either gun before, and could hardly contain themselves. Make the noises, Toby! Make the noises! Bup, 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 bup. Bup, bup. Bup, pew, pew, pew! Three, two, three. Yeah, I know. We'll like After a good morning shooting, we refilled the belts and magazines while we broke for lunch. The belt filling machine was the most curious and ingenious contraption. Watching it work was a bit mesmerizing. Using it, however, is not a completely mindless task, and it does require attention if stoppages are to be avoided. After it was all said and done, it was back to the firing point. We experienced one separated case on the day, which was cleared by the chambering of a subsequent round. The neck had come away, and this was found on the end of the next round in the belt. It was obviously not fired. We experimented with a spent casing collector. This device was used for rolls where they didn't want casings falling down into vehicles. It was attached with a substantial bracket onto the bottom of the gun. 
As mentioned earlier, the fact that the association owns so much of this ancillary equipment adds a great deal to the experience. Functioning of the magazine was presented with a cutaway version. Again, notice the velocity that the spent casings are ejected from the gun. I can tell you, there are fewer things more rewarding in one shooting experience than sitting with a lapful of a 250-round Vickers belt that used to be full. Opportunity was taken to experiment with the collection's Sangster mount. Introduced in 1915, this small detachable tripod was intended to supplement the main tripod and serve as a backup in the event of damage or destruction of the primary. It also allowed for firing in the prone position. It was commonly seen secured to the barrel casing. Deployed, I couldn't help but see a passing similarity to the MG0815, the German machine gun which used a similar, more simple bipod arrangement, although provision for a butt was a most salient addition. Well, how many bad jokes have you made today? Oh, uh, none. No, no, I don't do them. Um, so I don't know any jokes, good or bad. <laughs> Um, you can see here in this view that this is in fact a Mark III version, which included small feet on the ends of the tripod legs to prevent them sinking to the ground too deeply. Upon seeing the Vickers fired with the Sangster mount, I was surprised at the lack of movement of the gun. With the firer's elbows firmly on the ground to govern the elevation, the gun bucked gently on firing, without the more significant and violent recoil of the MG0815 as seen on Sea and Arsenal. Elevation! Move back just a bit. Well, it doesn't matter, it doesn't need to be in, so... Well, just, it's, just, it's in front of your lovely face. Oh, well, no, just take it away, take it away. There we go, that's all right. <laughs> Load! Now, as shown here, as a function of this type of range work, with a limited amount of ammunition shot per serial, threading a three-quarters empty belt through the gun can prove to be somewhat awkward. One drawback here, and admittedly this is due to the constraints of range safety, is the requirement to hold the gun while working the crank handle. As you can see Rich demonstrate, it required a bit of hand changing to affect the proper load. Ready. Here, a better view of cocking the gun with the Sangster mount in the prone position. RG ammunition to the front, in your own time, go on. This practice was fired with the surplus Mark 7. And it appears as though there were a couple of duds in the mix. By many accounts, the Sangster mount was not generally well, used well, to any Dylan great degree, uh, and it was withdrawn from service shortly after the Great okay. War. You can see here in these views how the crank handle interfaces with the roller. This action is at the very heart of the functioning of the Vickers. This rotation allows for the lock and the breech to become separate, affecting extraction, ejection, and the loading of the next round.
In an effort to examine the heating of the Vickers and the Bren under rapid-fire conditions, a practice of 125 rounds fired at the rapid rate was undertaken. Go Go on. The rapid rate was defined as the 25-round service burst fired with a two-second pause between bursts. My relative inexperience with the gun was apparent when I mistook a number three stoppage for a number four. A simple stroke down on the crank handle was all that was required to correct it, and the gun resumed firing. All the faffing about had disrupted the lay to a degree, so a fine adjustment was required before resumption of firing. This was but a small window into what the Vickers was capable of. Truly sustained fire. Once the gun was cleared, the temperatures could then be measured. Muzzle 110. Breach 75. Oh. Uh, fire alarm's back. Send up. Base of barrel case in 80. Later on that day, I was invited to come to the collection and view the treasures within. Oh, and clean some machine guns. The sheer volume of machine guns and associated equipment was impressive. Each piece was dutifully explained by Rich as to its manufacture and service history. The Vickers was used all over the globe by many countries, and the collection reflects that. From early Great War examples to post-World War II international use. The behemoth 0.5-inch Vickers was a sight to behold. Similar, though larger, to the 303 version, this little-known gun was used in the anti-aircraft role, as well in the early generations of British light tanks and armoured cars. A most fascinating piece was the Vickers in the aircraft role, with the Constantinesco interrupter gear. Rich maintains a cutaway Mark I Vickers that shows with clarity the inner workings of the gun. All in all, a fantastic collection, run by one of the most knowledgeable people on the subject. It must not be forgotten, however, that the association maintains a webpage, a YouTube channel, and the usual social media links. The YouTube page in particular is a bevy of Vickers-related information, and touches on all kinds, from the technical to the historical. What can I say? The hospitality extended to the channel by Rich and the association members was beyond the call. From the kind invitation to the shoot and the viewing of the collection to the social time afterwards, the experience and more importantly the members have left a lasting impression. I can only hope that this bodes well for the possibility of future projects. If you'd like to support the channel, please stop by our Patreon page. The link is in the description below. And for more information on projects and updates between videos, follow us on our Facebook page.